is hamstrung. It's difficult to manage somebody like Wadi Mantas. It's almost impossible to manage him. It's very difficult to manage Fakili Balula because he's just inadequate in more, than way, more ways than one. They, they, there are so few good ministers in that cabinet. You cannot manage a farm stall on the plot line with that cabinet. They are useless. And I think that's your problem. You expect Ramaphosa to say big things, which he does. Then you expect him to implement those big things. You can't with that cabinet. Hello, my name is Donald and welcome to the number one media company, Worldview. At Worldview, we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our world view. Today we have with us the outspoken Dr. Pete Krokamp. Pete is a political analyst and a senior lecturer of political studies and international relations at the Northwest University. Pete, welcome. It's so great that we're finally able to have this little chat. Thank you, my pleasure. Pete, so let's start with the Taliban faction in KZN. It appears that the so-called RET faction has made a clean sweep at the recent KZN um, uh, KwaZulu-Natal ANC conference and that the RET faction managed to get their people elected to the key positions. How significant is this? Well, it's significant in the context of the fact that uh, KwaZulu-Natal has been uh, moving away from the ANC in many ways over the last uh, two or three elections. You'll remember if you look at the results of the local government elections in uh, 2000 and when was it? 2021. Yes. Um, yeah, the, the ANC actually got uh, a, a relative majority in that province, no absolute majority. In other words, if they, that election was a national election, they would have been in opposition benches. Uh, so there is a degree of alienation uh, uh, between the traditional support base of the ANC and the, and the party. Uh, but it's also a province that always presented... Uh, uh, the elected with alternatives. We had the National Republican, uh, the National Revolutionary Party. We have the IFP. We have a number of other parties uh, which allow people to exercise their votes differently if they don't agree with uh, ANC policies. Uh, but the significance of it is that uh, it will uh, bring the majority, or it will the largest uh, number of um, delegates will come to the leadership election. Uh, I am not convinced of the argument that Sikhli Sikilala was necessarily a Ramaphosa, uh, um, call it a supporter or a lieutenant, he certainly wasn't. Uh, it was always very difficult to judge who he would support in a leadership election. It's a volatile province. It's a province with a large number of political murders every year that settles the political contest at local government level. It is a in a deeply corrupt province, uh, the National Executive uh, Committee of the ANC in that province, uh, the provincial one, controls the procurement system at provincial level. They controls the procurement system in many local government uh, uh, municipalities. It, it, it is not an easy province to govern. So, uh, yes, it's significant in the context that it's an unstable political economy. It's an unstable uh, uh, political system. And it will impact on the ANC. And as you have seen, uh, when the president uh, went there to make a speech, he was uh, very humble, almost psychophantically so. In Afrikaans, they call it a little bit hard uh, almost desperately pleading for his political life and uh, fearing that they might uh, humiliate him, uh, really relying on one of his staunchest opponents in uh, Dubai not uh, to, 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 to ask of the audience not to offend the president, to remind them that he's actually the president of the ANC. It doesn't sound good to me. And do you think, what do you think of this chances of being elected, re-elected into, at, the end, at the end of the year? There's no, the, the, the ANC's got no alternative yet. Somebody might emerge from the cracks of all the instability. Uh, it's uh, you will hear the name of Lindiwe Sisulu. You will hear the name of um, Kize, uh, the former health minister. Uh, David Mabuza been in the running a while back. Uh, you will hear Paul Masitila is interested. Uh, Ronald Lamola is uh, has put his name in the hat, uh, but perhaps as uh, on the side of Ramaphosa, but uh, as a deputy president. But 
there are no strong candidates. And that's the problem that the so-called RET faction, and I, I'm hesitant to call them the RET faction because I don't think there's enough cohesion and consensus uh, among them, uh, ideological or political, or in terms of a single narrative uh, among them to really call them a, a unitary unit of, of political action. But they, they, there is no alternative. And that means that it's quite possible that the leadership election in December will be very, very unstable. Uh, there'll be uh, hard points will be made, uh, vicious arguments will follow, uh, and the real contest will be for the for the other members of the top six, Secretary General, the leader of the party, the Treasury General, etc. But there will be some degree of acceptance that uh, they will have to live with Ramaphosa for another four years. But uh, depending on the outcome of that leadership election and depending on the composition of the top six, uh, one could make assessments and assumptions about the likeliness that Ramaphosa will also be removed before the end of his second term, like uh, Jacob Zuma had been removed and like Tabumbeg had been removed. It, I can't imagine that he will necessarily survive a full second term. Well, if the ANC get an absolute majority, which means they have to go into coalition with other parties, things can change. And if they don't manage to put together a coalition and opposition parties put together a coalition and they elect a president from amongst the members in the National Assembly, well, then things obviously look a lot different. Pete, um, on that note, you've mentioned, and I believe it was on CakeNet, you've mentioned that Ramaphosa is a bit over being the president of South Africa. He's tired of being the president of South Africa. Why? Why is he tired of being the president of South Africa? Well, it's a very hard job. It's a very difficult job. And I don't think he expected to get the pushback the almost uh, salient revolt in the party against his leadership. I don't think he, he expected that. I thought he uh, assumed to, that he will get control of the political party, that he will have the majority support, at least in his first term. Uh, and, uh, well, he's not getting that. And he also assumed that he can, it will be easy to, to fix the problems at the National Prosecuting Authority, police, secu state security, he will get control over the bureaucracy and uh, that he will have enough electoral support to legitimize cleaning up the ANC. Well, uh, electoral support has declined to the extent that those who oppose him think, well, it doesn't really matter. It's, uh, it doesn't look like the people will necessarily vote for us even if we govern better. So the stakes are low as far as that's concerned. So they're opportunistic. So, yes, I, I think it, uh, in his world, the ideal world was he was like, uh, like Nelson Mandela, that he governs well, very popular in the first term, and that he ends his first term, and he does what he really wants to do and what his, uh, his, uh, his uh, family member, Patrice Mutshepa, does and go into business and be a wealthy and very active and uh, well-respected businessman. He didn't expect to end up in a situation where he will attend and provincial conference and fears for his life and fears for being booed and fear for being humiliated. I, I don't think it was part of his worldview of politics when he entered the presidency. He certainly didn't think that he has this massive moral uh, obligation to fix South Africa. It's going to be hard and a hard slog and he will have to take the pain and it will be, uh, he'll be humiliated. he will be contested. His views will be undermined, but eventually he will, uh, survive it all and he will put South Africa uh, on, a, on, a, on a different trajectory towards socioeconomic stability. I don't think he, he had that in mind. Uh, do you think there's a possibility then that he will resign, especially with the ongoing Palapala gate um, scenario? I think if he, if the National Prosecuting Authority decide to actually pursue him in terms of a legitimate charge, he will resign with immediate effect. He will not ignore the sidestep policy. Just remember, if you are asked to step aside in terms of the policy, you will not arrive at the leadership conference at the end of the year because um, it's unlikely that the case will be finalized by the end of the year. You have three months left. Uh, and uh, you can't compete on the basis that you are charged and that hopefully the charges, the, the matter will be settled before the conference and you can arrive there and you think you can win an election. He will step aside. I, I have no doubt that he will comply with the, 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 the line that is drawn in the sand for everybody else that uh, you have to step aside because it, it, this, that policy is strongly associated with him. I think he will walk away and I think he'll be quite happy to do so. He'll... 
I hope that South Africa is in better hands. It's quite possible that he would like to see that uh, Ronald Lamola takes South Africa further. You know, but I think he will he will leave, yes. Interesting. So in that scenario, okay, you've mentioned Lamola, but doesn't um, David Mabuza become the president of South Africa? Everybody fears that David Mabuza is the next president of South Africa. And everybody includes Salar Mabuza. Nobody wants a man with a tainted history like that to become the next president. And that's the only thing. Much of this is innuendo, it's assessment, it's alleged allegations, etc. There's no, he's never been charged and found guilty. There's no hard charges against him. But we've seen his political shenanigans. You'll remember the when I think he was the MEC for education. Uh, oh no, he was he was probably the premier already. And when they literally manipulated the metric results, that type of in, in a way to make the province look better. That, and that Nobody doubts that. We know that happened. It's not something that you go to court for and find guilty, go to jail for, but it happened. Uh, we know some of the things that he said publicly. We know that he doesn't really have the, call it political intelligence, to manage a complex and a complicated political economy such as that of South Africa. Now, everybody fears that Mabuza taking over. And I think he has settled to a large degree that he's not going to be the next president. He's got no constituency within the ANC. Uh, he was opportunistic in uh, swinging his support away from Lamini Zuma to Ramaphosa during the last uh, leadership election. That's almost unforgiving. It's almost like a form of treason. Nobody will trust you ever again. And I think he's, he's, he's just uh, he's occupying a position without any form of authority or merit or trust. Uh, he's got no political capital uh, uh, to form the basis of any political contest. No. But just logistically, how does that scenario play out? So will Ramaphosa just say, uh, will he just snub Mabuza and just say, listen, I rather want... No, um... no, 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 he, he doesn't have a choice. Uh, Ramaphosa doesn't make any decision when it comes to this. The, it will, the, it will uh, go down to the National Executive Committee of the ANC will have to come together. Uh, and they are normal. They, it, look, he's the deputy president, so it's very likely that he will, by default, will take over the presidency. But I have no doubt that the National Executive Committee will immediately step in and uh, uh, activate the process to elect new leadership and that he will be then, um, he will not make it, he will not survive that. But it could well be that the former pause resigns that he's for the time being, he will act as president until the issue has been resolved in the party. Yeah. Pete, um, so why doesn't Ramaphosa start acting like Tito Mbaweni? I mean, if he's tired of the job, why doesn't he just start saying and doing what he wants? If he's if he's has this intention of also resigning, I mean, just start doing and saying what you want to do. Well, the president is already saying and doing what he wants. He, he said that we will implement the Zondo Commission's uh, recommendations. He said we will clean up the National Prosecutor Authority. He says we will pursue those who are corrupt. He said we will um, act against those in the party who uh, uh, bring the party in disrepute. He, he said all the things that, that uh, one would assume a good leader should say. He says, I will privatize large parts of ESCOM. He says, I need the private sector needs to create jobs. We as a government can't do it. He says all the things which one can assume, it must be incredibly unpopular within the party. He's saying the hard things. He's just not doing it but he's really saying the hard things. He, he says exactly what Tito Mbaweni said. In fact, he says more. He is more constructive in his criticism than Tito Mbaweni was. The only thing is because of uh, the, the instabilities within his political party and his efforts to keep the party together and to maintain his own position as the leader of the party, he's hamstrung. It's difficult to manage somebody like Gwery Mantas. It's almost impossible to manage him. It's very difficult to manage for Kilian Balula because he's just inadequate in more, than way, more ways than one. They, they, there are so few good ministers in that cabinet. You cannot manage a farm stall on the plot line with that cabinet. They are useless. And I think that's your problem. You expect Ramaphosa to say big things, which he does. Then you expect him to implement those big things. You can't with that cabinet. They, you, Lindiwe Zulu, how do you implement anything with her? Uh, Lindiwis is Sulu, who's deliberately trying to undermine the president. She sits in his cabinet. You, you cannot manage South Africa with a cabinet like that. So hopefully if he wins the next leadership election and he appoints a new cabinet, the ability to manage things uh, will be at the forefront of his mind. 
As it is now, he's trying to survive politically. That's why he sits with this scrapyard of politicians, trying to manage a very complicated economy. You can't do that. Pete, um, we've recently spoken to John Stiernazen and, of course, the leader of the Democratic Alliance. And he says there's a possibility, he believes, that the ANC will split into two factions, two parties, by the end of the year. What do you think is the chances of that happening, that the ANC will split into two parties? Look, uh, as long as I can remember, uh, opposition parties and the commentary that says that the ANC will split, and they still haven't split. Uh, the 10% support that uh, uh, Masue Lakata got uh, as a consequence of the resignation of uh, Tabu Mbeki is not a split, and uh, uh, Bandula Misa's breakaway is not a split. That's just splinter faction finding other ways to do, uh, to make politics. So the, if you say they're going to split, uh, what will these two camps look like? Just remember the, the big battle in KwaZulu Natal in South Africa is, is it's not necessarily for political power. It's for political power to control the procurement process. It's for political power to get access to the treasury, to get access to the resources of the state. Remember, the ANC is embedded in corruptness. It's thoroughly corrupt. Everybody in the party is desperately seeking access to the system to extract the resources of the state and spend it themselves and their own families and the patronage system. Um, so if you split away, it's dark and lonely out there. You have nothing to distribute. You, know, you have nothing to dispense. Oh, first of all, you must get a support base. Then the people working for you must in some other way find the benefit of splitting away from a party which gave them access to the benefits of the state. That's why nobody breaks away. That's why Kusata doesn't break away. The Communist Party doesn't break away because you actually suspend your access to the benefits of the treasury in South Africa, of the resources of the state. So will there be a split? As long as I can remember, they say that. Will there be a faction breaking away? It's quite possible. But who will it be? It can't be Lindivis Shule. It will not be Ace Mahashule. Uh, you cannot break away just one province, uh, can't be as well in Kizi. Where will this split come from? I think politicians say these things without thinking twice, without having to explain it. I hope you're asking, how will this permeate? How will it evolve? How will it develop? Who will these factions be? What will drive them and what will feed them to survive politically, their alter and economically? Because that's how you can make an assessment of the sustainability of a split and the likeliness of such a split. I think it's just nonsense that they talk. It's, it's very unlike. There might be a splinter group breaking away, but a split in the party, nonsense. On that note, do you think then if the ANC loses power in 2024, then there will be a split because there's That's no more, possible. There is no more funds to distribute, they will be the split then? Exactly. Exactly. That's possible. Because then one split might think that they could regain power again if they sanitize them from the stigma of the other one. That might well be possible that... Call it the Ramaphosa faction, if you wish. We'd say, well, the only way to regain power again, to get the elected to vote for us again, we must get rid of Ace Mahashule and Zweli and Kizi, and they will break away as a faction. That, that, that's possible. That's theoretical, but it's possible. But that is if, you, if the, the stakes are completely different from what it is now. What do you think of Tabo Mbeki's recent um, eight Laten, a speech where he... Uh, castrated the ANC that they're not doing enough at uh, J.C. Duarte's funeral? Look, uh, his relationship with, with, uh, with Ramaphosa was never a really uh, a particularly good one. And one of uh, the, 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 the advisors, the good friend of Tabu Mbeki recently said to me that Ramaphosa actually approached uh, Mbeki and said, listen, uh, Thank you for the support you give me in the National Executive Committee because Ramaphosa does a, uh, make it does a lot there to support the case of Ramaphosa. And Jalen Sitenze also helps. Uh, so thank you for all that support, but I might need you to get closer to the fire when it comes to implementing decisions. Uh, would you mind considering a position in my cabinet? Mbeki said, no, thank you. But that's the, that's the length that Ramaphosa is willing to go. Just think of the mindset that comes up with that idea. And obviously, uh, Mbeki wasn't interested. But their relationship has always been, it's a little bit fraught. Just remember that Mbeki actively undermined 
both Mandela and Ramaphosa, which led to him becoming president by influencing the executive committee of the ANC. So the, friend, the relationship has never been good. But that's the one thing. The other thing is that uh, Mbeki thinks of himself as I make things happen. I can make things, I can, I, I can run the economy. I've done so. The South African economy grew at 5%. It was, uh, uh, the debt rates was extremely low. Interest rates were low. Unemployment was, was much higher, much better than now. So I can run a complicated economy. And he looks at the, uh, Ramaphosa and he says, nice guy, but can't do the job. And I think partially, is his uh, feeling of being uh, superior. Partly it's a bit of a competition. At last, there's another good guy, because remember, we had so many bad guys in the meantime. He competes with this guy because he himself has been labeled as a bad guy within his own party eventually. But also, I think he's, um, maybe he's concerned about where South Africa is heading. Maybe there's enough people around him who says to him, listen, unless we do something desperately quickly, we, so we, we will have nothing. We will have the ass heaps of this country to negotiate the future on. Maybe he's concerned about it, but it's easy to be concerned because he's exactly right. Nothing has happened as far as this national consensus, this coalition of ideas that the president will talk about. All the things that he mentions now, it's not just bullshit, it's nonsense. It, nothing of that happened. Maybe it was, it was mentioned somewhere. Maybe there was a meeting, but this pact, there's no architecture to respect. There's no agreement. There's no single discourse. There's never been any serious discussions about a pact that will form the basis of new policy for South Africa, new agreements between state capital and labor. And by the way, we already have NETLAC. Why does NETLAC not know about all this if there was this pact already? And uh, what do you think, what position would he have? Garten, if he was in the cabinet, I mean, Minister of Finance, Minister of International Relations. Are you talking about now? Uh, Mambeki. I mean, no, if... no, I, no, I, th I, no, I think it will be one of those uh, positions like a minister in the presidency. Oh, the okay. Minister in the presidency is usually also responsible for implementation of national development plan and stuff like that, you know. So it will be somebody that just a mastermind with some authority that can impose a particular policy regime. It won't be somebody to manage the department. I think uh, you will. Uh, Top of Mickey will never say yes to that. But if it's the mastermind within the cabinet who will design a policy and then uh, negotiate the implementation of that policy, I think it was something like that they had in mind. Pete, um, a lot of people are now talking about a 2024 election being a watershed for South Africa. But do you think, to a certain extent, that South Africa will survive up until 2024, will survive the ANC's shenanigans? Um, if Ramaphosa stays where he is, yeah, we will survive it. Uh, as it is, if, if, if he doesn't survive, then the ANC is really toast. Then it, uh, they're in a really, really big trouble. Remember, uh, most of the uh, surveys has indicated that the ANC has X percentage, and then the next 10% they get because of Ramaphosa's presence in the system. People are actually willing to vote for him. In the last election, we saw that that extra 10% suddenly is not there anymore. People don't think of Ramaphosa as a good guy anymore. There's a public opinion. The public opinion is turning against Ramaphosa, which means you don't get the benefit of the election. That's why they dipped to 45% in the local government election. In 2024, the president, maybe it has consequences, two or three percentage points. Maybe at least it doesn't dip to, to, to below 40% because he's there. But there's a real chance that, in fact, there's a very slim chance of the ANC actually getting 50% again. And remember, it, it's got only a bearing on what happens in the National Assembly, not necessarily the National Council of Provinces. They might lose two, maybe a, even a third province, but they still will still have a majority there. They will still control the majority of councils. So it is quite possible that they will lose an election with Ramaphosa, I think I think I think it's very possible, but it will be possible for Ramaphosa to put together a coalition of parties because they will come in at 45, 46, 47, and there'll be enough smaller parties to form a coalition. If the ANC becomes so unstable that Ramaphosa is not there and the cat fight evolves and develops for leadership of the party, there's not enough time to the election for them to recover from that. 
and to implement the type of policies that will convince people that they will actually govern better, then they run a real risk of dipping below 40. And that will be the end of the liberation movement. Um, but do you think in that scenario, do you think the ANC will just give up power? Because like you said, many are implicated in corruption. They have everything to lose by just walking away. So will they just say, okay, we've lost, we're going home now. Do you think that that will really happen? Um, look, Justice Malala put it, uh, so he says that if you've stolen everything, there's nothing left to steal. There's still one thing you can steal. That's an election. I wouldn't be surprised if there's an effort to influence the election in some other way. I, I think the Russians can try to influence the elections. They've done so in America. Uh, I think there, there might be efforts to, to impact the result, the results of the elections. Uh, the question whether they will walk away if they lose, I think they will lose the election. That's not the big problem that we have. Now, the new governing coalition must take control of the army, the police, state security, the bureaucracy, and all the other institutions of the state. If it's a, a new coalition that's considered to be significantly legitimate and representative of South Africa, it is, it's, it is quite possible that it's going to be difficult, it's going to be hard, but it's possible for them to have a time to establish themselves. But if the DA is the majority party, the liberal majority party, South Africans are not liberals. It's a big problem. They don't want to believe it, but it's a problem. The second thing is, they have John Stevenson as their leader. The majority party usually, their leader becomes the president. Do you really think a white man is going to be president of South Africa now? And even if a white man is going to be president, you think it's going to be John Stenison? Madness. The DA does nothing to prepare themselves for the realities of a post-ANC South Africa. You cannot arrive in the National Assembly having to elect a new president in a coalition from amongst the members of the National Assembly, and you stand up and you suggest John Steenhuysen. It's ridiculous. It's not going to happen. Which means, unless the DA is willing to reform themselves, the likeliness of the ANC putting together a coalition increases exponentially. Because eventually, it will not be possible for the DA to put together a coalition. Not because the ANC has a better opportunity to put or are better suited to put together one, but if the DA can't put together one, <clears throat> then the ANC mm. could uh, buy. Because remember, they have the resources. They control the state. They control the procurement system. They can make all sorts of ridiculous promises to members of opposition parties. Now the relationship between the EFF and the, the ANC is rock bottom. It's in the pits. It's, it's non-existent. They hate each other. Until they all uh, are in search for the elusive, or the elusive search for power, then suddenly politicians can go into all sorts of agreements. You'll remember that Armand Mashaba had an agreement with the EFF in Johannesburg. They don't sound like they're bedmates politically, ideologically, in terms of their own histories. But Armand Mashaba and Julius Malima met each other at Julius at uh, Winnie Mandela's house. They're friends. They were mutual friends of Winnie Mandela. That's why they worked together so well in Johannesburg. The only thing is, the very first thing that the EFF did is, they went after the procurement system and all sorts of populist policies. And because they were part of a coalition, that if you can't maintain the coalition, you will lose power completely. Herman Mashaba was held by the short and curlies. And it had consequences. So the, EF, the ANC don't want to go into a coalition with the EFF because you can't win. The DA refused to go into a coalition with the EFF. So you will have to set yourself up to be acceptable to a whole range of other political parties. John Stenison is not going to be a leader in that coalition. But Pete, do you think a majority of South Africans still care whether the president has a white face or a black face? Yeah. 
Yeah, they do. And and you base that on opinion polling, or I, I'm no, just curious. It, yeah, it's, it's, it, 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 first of all, John Stevenson is a liberal. He's an offensive type of liberal. He's not a compromising liberal. He's not a liberal that you can go into pacts and agreements with. He's hardcore liberal. Uh, his political style is offensive. His tone of voice when he speaks to people is offensive. He has a type of personality that will alienate his coalition partners. And add him to Helen Zill. Can you think of a more offensive politician than Helen Zill? Can you think of somebody that deliberately offend people uh, more regularly, more often, more uh, as a matter of natural uh, behavior than Helen Zilda. These are the people that you have to go into a coalition with. These are the people that the majority of Black South Africans must vote for. It's not going to happen. Black South Africans, 46% of us are unemployed. We're poor. 70% are poor. We need somebody that's caring, somebody that creates the impression that not telling us the market will look after us. Don't worry, the trickle-down economy will eventually look after you. There will be opportunities which you have to take up once you have a good education, once you're empowered, which you have to do, by the way, yourself. Who's going to believe that madness? Are you, are you going to buy people into uh, legitimizing your presence with that type of political master narrative which they sell? We're looking for somebody that believes in a mixed economy, that sees the state having specific responsibility, a specific responsibility towards the poor, the marginalized, not telling us the market will look after you. Don't worry. If we get foreigners to come and invest here, eventually there will be all sorts of opportunities for you. Wait, we will fix the school system. And when you eventually add up, you might find a job. You might That might not give you a middle-class life, but you, that will set you up for your children will be better. If you're poor, don't come and tell me about the next generation. I want you to solve my problems now. For that, I need a very involved state. They pretend you don't have to do that. The market will solve that problem. Good governance, in other words, good management of the system will do it. They manage Cape Town perfectly well. They get clean orders every year. Have you seen how many people live in absolute poverty in Nyanga, Gugulete, Crossroads? You can name them. They can manage middle class people well. They have no track record of managing poverty. Yeah, it seems like they get clean audits because they don't spend their money. But um, Pete, no, no, they do spend. No, they do spend their money because you don't get a clean audit if you don't spend your money. They do spend their money, but they spend their money uh, in ways that maintain an efficient system. They do not spend their money to relieve poverty. They do not spend it. They want to give you a good service. They say, we will remove your bin and we will make sure there's water and there's electricity. But even infrastructure will not necessarily uplift a society that lives in the absolute deprived conditions. No education, uh, uh, no medical, good health services. They, they have nothing. You have nothing to lose. You're completely destitute. The state is completely absent. The police doesn't work. You're not safe, you're not secure, you're nothing. All those things must be provided for by the state immediately. It's hard to do those things. Pete, um, on that note, you've mentioned that you believe Action SA will be the second largest party come 2024. Is Action SA that party you're talking about that fights for the poor? No, they have, they have the potential to be the second uh, biggest party party in South Africa. Uh, if you look at the uh, local government elections recently in, uh, in, um, in the Eastern Cape, you know, it's, it seems like they have problems to operate beyond the, bo the borders of, of, of hard thing. Um, look, I think that, let me put it this way, if there's a coalition of partners and Bongani Beloy uh, becomes the next president, I think you have a chance of putting together a stable coalition. Uh, I'm not sure that the DA will want to work with him necessarily. But he's got the personality, the political intelligence, the empathy, and he understands that uh, South Africa can't be managed by markets only. You can't, he got a clean budget in Matrand year after year after year since he was 26 years. He knows that that's not good enough. He's seen the poverty there, how embedded it is. He knows that the state will have to have a role in that. You can't rely on the market only to do that. 
So I, I think that's a different headspace. So in that sense, there are good people in the in the in Access South Africa. I think Ethel Trollope, for all his mistakes, understand that you have to reach beyond privilege. You have to, in some other way, gain the trust of the poor, the destitute, and the marginalized South Africa. He understands that better than the liberals, I think, in the DA. But it's it's still they battle to get beyond. Uh, I think they've done well in Soweto. I think they might become the, the biggest party. It's possible for them to become the biggest party in Soweto. They've done well in Parkhurst, in that super high, upper-class white area in Johannesburg. So it seems like they, they gain traction across different constituencies. They got some support even from the FF, some support from the ANC, and definitely some support from the DA uh, during the last election. There's a lot of potential there. I'm not sure Herman Mashab is the right person to lead that party. I think the sooner Bungani Baloi takes over the party, the better for the party. But um, it, it, it's, a long, it's a long road, but I think there's something brewing there. The, 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 the real thing is that you can distinguish them uh, from other political parties on the liberal side in the sense that there's something xenophobic there, in the sense that they have a problem with foreigners in our economy and they blame the presence of foreigners on the high unemployment rate. Well, my friend Mike Schusler, who died recently, he said, well, it's actually, the statistics shows it's true. There are millions of foreigners doing work that South Africans could do, but it's not that simple. It doesn't mean when they leave, South Africans will just take over those jobs. But it, so it's quite possible that foreigners do contribute in the bad management of the influx of people across South African borders does have an impact uh, on, the, on, on unemployment. It is true that Foreigners have a specific presence in the informal in, in, in informal settlements and in the townships, and that they are easy targets. So there is political capital, political hate to be made out of that. That is the problem with, with that the EFF has. This pan-Africanism doesn't sell well in Soweto and in the informal settlements now. It doesn't sell well in Santon either. Somebody is looking for somebody to blame. And these foreigners are uh, uh, easy target. So you have this thing that Access South Africa cash in on the previous support base of the EFF, the DA, and the ANC because of this specific narrative that foreigners is a problem. In a country where there's 46% 46 unemployment, people are looking for reasons. And there you go. But that's interesting. So it seems like you're suggesting, I mean, we've gotten used to the president being the most powerful figure in South Africa, at least in terms of politics. But it seems like you're suggesting come 2024 that the president might be a compromised figure and not necessarily the most powerful figure. He might be someone like Bogani Beloya, who's not necessarily, he won't be um, the deciding person in that cabinet. Look, once you occupy the office, you quite often the, the aura of power that comes with it, quite often it, 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 uh, many a compromised figure manage to establish themselves well once they have the, the, the power of an office. So it's quite possible that uh, Bongani Baloy can make a speech on his very first day as president of South Africa that blows everybody out of the park and they think, oh, yes, somebody at last that's going to make things happen that will help us to get jobs. It's possible that he can make a speech like that and that people can buy into it and give him some time. The same, that's how Ramaphosa, when he became uh, the ANC leader and eventually the president, his very first speech was so impressive. I wrote the story about, we, we're back on track. We're heading in the right direction. And well, how wrong I've been. So it's quite possible to, with the power of that office that, uh, that he can uh, find some room to, 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 to maintain his presence for a while. But you have to do it uh, during an election is again, next election, local government elections, provincial elections, you have to repeat. Uh, and you, you have to actually fulfill your promises. We live in a society where, if you, if you think about it, only 14% of the eligible vote in South Africa voted for the ANC in the last election. They govern South Africa with 14% of the eligible vote. You can't maintain that. You can't sustain that. Baloy will have to do something about this electoral support. The Action South Africa will have to do about electoral support. And the other thing is, you just remember, if you're part of the DA, just be very careful for the identity of the DA. 
the DA's identity is one of that battle to, uh, to keep its black leadership that has become reactionary in terms of its liberal values, that has very little empathy for the case of the poor, except for explaining that they will govern better. It's not enough. It's not enough. So um, Action South Africa may just find that the DA is not the best political partner that you can have if you want to uh, impose the, the, the notion that the liberation movement is gone and liberal democracy will do the good things for you now. Why do you think um, Mashaba is not the person to be the next president of South Africa? Why Bongani Beloy and not Herman Mashaba? Um, I just think he's a more polished politician. He's a more, he, he, he's got, he actually managed something really well. It's just a, just a town council, but he managed it well. Uh, there's no evidence that Johannesburg was any better off when Mashaba managed it. And it plots a deal due to the coalition government that they've been with in the EFF in, but uh, Johannesburg wasn't a better place. In fact, we pay, suddenly paid more taxes. The 6,000 liters of water that the ANC gave me, they took away from me. I had to pay now for it, that, that benefit that we had. So uh, now the, ANC, the, the DA is now governing uh, Johannesburg in a coalition. Uh, they have just, uh, together with uh, some provincial managers, they have just increased the rates and taxes of schools, almost suffocating private schools in Johannesburg now. You, you can't pay. The, I talk about private schools that had a rates and tax bill of 6,000 rand that now goes to 30,000 rand. One private school told me they will have to fire at least two teachers to pay their rates and taxes bill. That's under the management of the DA. So the DA doesn't have a good track record of managing Johannesburg. Aaron Mashaba has no record of, of good track record in Johannesburg. Uh, he sells the idea that works now that foreigners are taking the job opportunities of South Africans. That is, that's what he's mostly known for. And the fact that he's a capitalist and that he was a member of the Free Market Foundation, which is hardcore capitalists. They're libertarians. They're not even capitalists. They're libertarians. They are right-wing capitalists. He's not a good sale in terms of elections. Bangani Baloy is something different. That's an interesting term, a right-wing capitalist. Um, exactly. Pete, um, what do you think the DA needs to do to become electable again in your eyes? What's the process they need to go through? They must uh, design policies that will speak to the lived experiences of the majority of South Africans. They must be careful for the idea that you can design policies which you think will work and then impose it on society. Policy must be the result of the urges and the needs and the consensus that you unearth from within society. The ANC has, uh, has neglected that responsibility. The DA don't think it's their responsibility. They think we can, if we design a system that we can manage well, we can impose it on society. You, you can't do that. People are not looking for a system that manages them well. They're looking for a system which allows them to live a decent life, to give them their dignity back, to give them jobs, give them opportunities. And a liberal system being imposed on him, a free market system being imposed on him, telling them that your generation will not necessarily benefit. But if you just comply, the next generation will see the reward. We will build your demographic dividend over time and it will be uh, then we dispense from the one generation or by the one generation and move on to the next generation. It, it, it doesn't work in the short term. It doesn't work for people. And I think that that's a DA's problem. Uh, they have this, this superiority about understanding everything, having the successful narrative. We just buy into what is good in Western Europe and American free market society. Look, look, low uh, inflation, low unemployment, well-governed societies, open economies. And they think you can simply impose that on South Africa and uh, people will vote for you. I, I, I'm not convinced of that. But it also seem, seems like you're suggesting that a DA needs black leadership to become. Oh, yes. um, but how do you achieve that without it looking like it was a BE appointment, that the, that the black person was just skyrocketed to the top? How do you make it seem natural? They, they had wonderful leadership 
that was not BE leadership. They had Bongani Baloy, they had Lindivisi Sulu, I, there's a whole um, Balin Tuli. They had wonderful leadership. None of them had been BE appointed. None of them has been put in a position just because they're black. And what did they do? They alienated them, deliberately so, by, uh, by bringing in a stormtrooper like Alan Zoll and somebody like John Steenhuisen, who sought to impose a liberal type of system uh, which is devoid of any form of empathy, which doesn't want to see policy as the result of a compromise, but rather something that you design like an architecture, you sit in a room and you design what you think is best and then you impose it on, on the party, impose it in South Africa. They will deny that they do that. They will tell you how democratic they are, that they have regular conferences. But why don't you try to propose or reject Helen Zoll? Why don't you try to try Mazzoni, Natasha Mazzoni? Why don't you try to disagree with her? They're all the same. They're all the same. They think they know what's good. They have the wrong headspace, the wrong mindset for reaching compromises with other demographics. I can understand why black South Africans will not vote for the DA. I can understand why it's hard for them to keep their leadership, their black leadership. They alienate them. And do you think the star has waned for a party like the EFF, that they've reached their ceiling and they're not going to go beyond it or they're going to slowly start to drop? Well, if you see the, the, the star has waned, that it won't help you to understand them. I think what, uh, what you must remember, is it's a black middle class party. Most commentators uh, wrongly uh, think that they a left party. They're not left party. They, most of their support base come from young and middle class people. And half of their support base work for government and the other half work in the private sector. And um, the reason why they find it difficult to move to the next level is simply because there are limitations to the black middle class. The black middle class, they used to be around about 6 million. There's a rapid decline in the black middle class. Much the same as in America, the data has shown that in South Africa, if your parents are middle class, that demographic dividend, that benefit is not necessarily passed on to you. In other words, your children is not better. You remember when we were young, you were young as it is, but my, my grandparents were poor, my parents were better off, they were for government. I work for the private sector and my children will be much better off. So every, every generation is better than the previous generation. Uh, if you're black in South Africa, because of the way that the system is structured, because of the ideals of the free market economy, the trickle down economy, it's quite often hard to maintain that middle class uh, uh, capacities that you develop. But that's the problem that the EFF has. There's natural limits. And then the other thing is 90% of the youth support base are just not registered. It's the same worldwide. Young people do not register because you only start participating, participating active in politics if you have something to lose. If you have a house, if you have a bond, if you have a car payment, if you have rates and taxes, then you have a vested interest in politics. Then you start to participate. People, uh, 19 year old people, I don't think 25% of them are registered to vote. That's where the, 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 the EFF has their support base. And the middle class, the middle class, Remember, they have left the ANC. And we know from South African politics that once an individual has swapped parties or changed parties once, he can do so again. The DA runs the same risk of losing the, the colored vote in the Western Cape. Because they've been with the ANC, and now with the DA, they can move. The same thing with the black middle class. They move from the ANC to the if, if they may well move to action South Africa as well. That's the thing. That's the problem with the middle class people. It's quite possible for them to move. Interesting. Peter, what do you think of independent candidates like Musi Maimane, Mr. Zibi, or even a person like Chief Justice Mugweng Mugweng in 2024? Hopeless cases. Look, they're going to change the electoral system to allow for individual candidates like they that stand. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like yet. As it is, you'll, you'll need around about 200,000 people to vote for you just to make it into the National Assembly. But th that system hasn't really been agreed on. So we, we don't know what will be the result there. But Musma Mani is, is, 
He's a spent force. There's, there was, there's never been anything. I can understand why the DA got rid of him. I can't understand why they got him to in that position in the first place. He was one of the brainchilds, by the way, of Alan Zoll, and uh, the same way that Lindiwe Sisulu was. Sisulu was. Uh, Masibuku, sorry. Lindiwe Masibuku was. It's a, it, 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 people are forced into systems at a very young age. By the way, Lindiwe Masibuku was known in Parliament for not exactly doing the hard miles, but uh, loving to make speeches. Uh, that's when you put somebody into a position without putting somebody through the drills in the ranks of junior positions necessarily. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't see a future much for, for independent candidates. Uh, even at local government level, they battle. You get a sprinkle of them here and there, but it's hard if you don't have a political party with an architecture, administrative architecture, without financial support. It's very hard to make it in politics to convince people to vote for you. You must be very charismatic, like a preacher could make a bit of a dent, you know, somebody that already has some standing in society. It's not going to be my money. It's, I, I, Mukhwing Mukhwing is a, it's a it's, it's nothing. He's got no support base. He's, he's a joke. You, you can't believe the things that he says. He's got a church. Maybe the church will vote for him. I mean, isn't there also a law? Someone has told me there's, there's a law that um, doesn't allow a judge to run for president to seek higher office. Well, I, I can't imagine it has ever happened, but first of all, if he does that, he will, of course, lose his privileges as a judge, and he's got lifelong privileges, so it'll be very stupid if he does that. He gets a massive salary for as long as he lives, medical aid, pension fund, car, whatever, administrative personnel. Why, why would they keep all that up? So it, it, it sounds rather ridiculous to do that in the first place, but... The uh, madness comes easily to Mukwing Mukwing sometimes. It's quite possible. Some of the things he said is just weird. So it, it's possible that he, will, he can uh, envisage or pursue something like that. Uh, I don't know if there's a law that says he's, they're not allowed to do that. I just know he will certainly lose all the privileges of a judge if he does that. Well, Pete, um, that's all the questions I have. Thank you so much for your wise analysis. I want to give you one last op opportunity if you want to say something to our audience or, or just answer a question that you'd hope I'd ask you. Um, when I, in the last election, I decided not to vote. I know I live in the wrong area. If I lived in Soweto, uh, it would have been different. But that's the ironic, irony of South African politics. Because people decided not to vote in the last election, we got the ANC under 50%. No single political party has managed that. It was because some of us decided not to vote. With that in your pipe and smoke it if you think about coalitions and politics of South Africa in the future. But thanks for asking. Nice to talk to you. Thank you, Pete. To our viewers, you love this conversation. If you've made it this far, please like this video, share it as widely as possible, and subscribe to our channel for more such content. My name is Donald, and you've been watching Worldview. View.